In chapter 7, our main focus will be tracking the flows of money happening throughout our economy, uh, looking at some national income accounts, how they are structured, and then finally we'll be measuring GDP or the gross domestic product. So how GDP is calculated. We'll also look at the aggregate price level that we talked about earlier and the inflation rate, how the inflation rate is calculated. So let's look at what chapter 7 has in store for us. We're going to start with a circular flow diagram, which is a diagram showing us flows of money happening throughout our economy. So this diagram seems quite complicated, but it's actually quite simple. And we're going to partition it into smaller parts to understand some of the money flows that are happening over here. Before we go any further, notice that there are four boxes over here indicating the four main sectors of our economy. And in pink over here, I have the three main markets through which these sectors interact with each other. All of these arrows over here are indicating the direction of money flows. So for example, this green arrow over here is indicating money spent by the government on final goods and services. As we break down these flows of money into smaller parts, we will end up with some national income accounts. Almost all countries will calculate a set of numbers known as your national income accounts or product accounts. This economic data is very important because in order to make sound economic decisions or policy choices, we need to know what we are working with. The professional economist will depend upon economic data in much the same way that a doctor depends upon a patient's vital signs like pulse, blood pressure, temperature, etc. So in order to understand economic developments and be able to give useful advice to policymakers, business people, unions, leaders, economists, we all must have up-to-date and accurate data. In Canada, Statistics Canada or StatCan in short gathers all of this data and gives us these national income accounts. So remember the middle part of the diagram, we had four main sectors of the economy. These are your household, firms, government and the rest of the world. You can think of them as your main four economic agents. In the macro economy, we're aggregating over all households. So we'll be looking at behavior of households in the aggregate. Likewise for firms, government, and then the rest of the world. So each of these sectors comprises of thousands or millions of individual firms or individual households, etc. The three main markets in our macroeconomy, which were the pink ones in our circular flow diagram, are the goods and services market, your factor markets, and financial market. Now, goods and services market was the market in which your final goods are traded. Final goods are those goods which are purchased by the end consumer. So if I'm a baker and I'm buying a bag of flour, that bag of flour, it's not a final good. Final good will be the product that I make out of that flour. So if I'm making cupcakes or cakes or any type of pies, once the consumer purchases my product sold by the baker, that product is the final good. Likewise, if you are buying flour, for personal consumption, for making cookies or cakes at home, that bag of flour is a final good. So in goods and services market, we are only looking at buying of final goods and not any raw materials or inputs that go into the production process. Then we had your factor markets. Three main factors of production are your land, labor and capital. So we typically use L for labor, N for land, and K for physical capital. Households are going to sell these services or these factors to firm. And as you sell your labor service or you rent out your land or you rent out your capital, you earn something against that. So factor market is where households and firms interact with each other for the exchange of these factors. Firms will use these factors of production in order to produce these final goods. Financial markets are your markets where we are again interacting with each other, but now as savers and borrowers. So when I purchase a stock or bond, it's my saving as an individual household that is flowing into the financial market. A firm, when it issues stock or issues bonds, it is the one that is now borrowing money through financial market. So buying and selling of stocks and bonds, different type of financial instruments, all of this will come in our financial side of the economy. And as we focus on the flows of money happening vis-a-vis -vis each particular economic sector, we'll understand the interaction between economic agents through these different markets. So I have taken a subsection of my circular flow diagram of income and spending. And now we're going to look at how money flows to and from households. Remember that land, labor, capital, households sell these factor services to firms through factor markets and in exchange for these factor services earn income in the form of wages, rents, interests and profits. As households earn this income, they have to pay some tax to the government. So money flows out of the household to government in the form of taxes. And that's 
that's why I have a negative T over here. Households also receive some additional income, which is not earned income. And this could be in the form of social security safety nets, in the form of unemployment insurance. It could be pension payments from the government. It could be child tax benefit payments from the Canadian government to households. So these are all referred to as transfers and transfers are received by households from the government. So once households have this overall income from factor services, from transfers, net of taxes, it can now spend money as it sees fit. So the households will be spending money on various type of goods and services in your goods market. So this is the aggregate spending of all households in Canada on final goods and services. Whatever money households have left over after they have spent on final goods and services, that is called their private savings. And these private savings are channeled into our financial markets. So when households buy stocks and bonds, they are participating in financial markets and their savings are flowing into financial markets. Let's write these flows of money in the form of some identities. So this is the overall aggregate disposable income of all households in this economy. Disposable income is your overall income earned through wages, rents, interest, profits. So these are your factor payments minus taxes paid to the government and plus any transfers received from the government. From this disposable income, households spend money on consumption. Whatever we are left with is your private savings. So we have two main identities over here that are two main national income accounts for any major economy. So as we go through various sectors and their flows of money, we'll end up with certain national income accounts or identities as I like to call them for now. Now government is my main entity. Government earns money primarily through taxes, but government also gives some money to household in the form of those transfers that we talked about. Some examples of transfers in Canada are are your Canada pension plan. We have the SERP payment that was introduced during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have the child tax benefit payments, CCB. So these are just some examples. Government earns a net tax revenue, NTR, which is taxes net of transfers. Now, once the government has this earning, it can also now spend money on goods and services. So when government spends money on goods and services, we refer to it as government purchases. Government purchases, remember, are again spending on final goods and services. Some examples of these could be salaries to your bureaucrats, payments to different firms which are performing some task or producing a good or service for the government, government undertaking major projects, constructing railroads, airports, etc. So just like any economic agent, government earns income and then spends money on final goods. Whatever money is left with the government is called our public savings. If government is earning more than it is spending, public savings are positive and money will flow from the government to our financial market. However, we have seen that government sometimes spend a lot more than what they're earning in tax revenue. And in this case, money will flow from financial market to the government. Government itself has to now borrow money in order to bridge this gap over here. A major national income account that we get over here is your budget balance or public savings. Whenever your budget balance is positive, your net tax revenue is higher than your government purchases, your government is running a budget surplus. Whenever your budget balance is a negative number, that's indicating to you that now spending of the government is higher than its tax revenue and that is referred to as a budget deficit. So overall in terms of national income accounts, this is my third identity. Let's look at how the rest of the world interacts with our domestic economy. One of the main routes for foreigners to interact with each other is through our exports and imports. As Canadian goods and services are bought by foreigners, against them we earn revenue and this is referred to as your exports. When we purchase foreign produced goods and services, we end up sending money abroad and that is your imports. Goods market is not the only market through which foreigners interact with us, also interact with us through financial markets. So if a foreigner buys a domestically issued, a Canadian company issued stock or a Canadian government issued bond or Canadian corporate bonds, money flows into our economy. This is a way that domestic entities in Canada can borrow from foreigners and it could be Canadian individuals borrowing from foreigners, it could be Canadian companies borrowing from foreigners or it could be your government borrowing from foreigners. Vice versa would be when we as Canadians are purchasing foreign issued securities. So when we buy a US issued corporate bond, US government issued treasury bill, we are now sending money abroad holding that foreign issued security in exchange. So we are in effect lending to foreigners. 
earners. We'll focus on these flows more in Chapter 10. The national income account that arises from the foreigners' participation in our goods market is a very common one, your trade balance. Net exports are your exports minus imports, total earnings earned through selling goods and services to foreigners, minus our spending on foreign produced goods and services. NFI is your net foreign investment, which is looking at lending to the rest of the world, so money flowing out, minus borrowing from the rest of the world, that is money flowing into your economy. The last flows of money that we're looking at are vis-a-vis -vis firms. Firms are the buyers of factors in our factor market, they buy land, labor and capital resources, and in exchange for these resources, resources, they pay wages, rents, interests, and profits. And this flow of money goes from firms to households. In our financial market, remember, we have this pool of savings generated. We have savings coming from households and we have the government savings coming from the government. Purchases of new physical capital stock by firms is called investment spending. And in order to invest, firms need to borrow money. Firms are now borrowing the money that is pooled together in our financial markets to finance their purchases of new physical capital stock. If a firm buys a laptop or a new computer, refrigerators, ovens, these are all physical capital stock purchased by a firm. Total investment spending is not just purchases of new physical capital stock, it is also changes to their inventories. Let's look at some terminology that I used earlier. Investment spending is purchases of new physical capital stock plus changes in inventories. So change I'll typically donate as delta. Inventories are simply stocks of goods that firms hold in order to facilitate their business operations. So for example, for a given year, a firm produces a thousand dollar worth of light bulbs, but it only ends up selling nine hundred dollars worth of light bulbs. So at the end of that year, it will have $100 worth of light bulbs still left over. Its overall stock of inventory will increase by $100. In order to understand the concept of inventories, you can think of your firm as some retail space where it's selling these light bulbs. And at the back, it has a warehouse or some storage facility. Whenever it produces more than it sells, warehouse inventories will go up. And whenever it produces less than what it ends up selling for that year, its inventories will go down. So it is possible that it produced a thousand dollar worth of light bulbs, but they ended up selling twelve hundred dollars worth of light bulbs. So where did those additional two hundred dollars worth of light bulbs come from? These are basically laying around in the warehouse from some previous time period. And in this case, your inventories must have gone down. Tracking the change of inventories is very important for calculating GDP, especially when we calculate GDP through the expenditure approach. You'll also come across terms like intermediate goods and services. Intermediate goods and services are goods and services which are bought by one firm from another firm. So they're still a part of some bigger production process. Intermediate goods and services are therefore also referred to as raw materials or inputs. Final goods and services on the other hand are goods and services which are purchased by the end or the final consumer and they are not purchased by a firm. Don't forget that in the goods market, we're only tracking the flows of money or the money spent on final goods and services. We do not look at money spent on intermediate goods or inputs. Finally, we are now close to calculating our gross domestic product or GDP. It's the measure of the total value of final goods and services produced in the economy during a given year. So note that GDP is spending only on final goods. It's time bound. It's measured for a specific time period. And it's also geographically bound. It's all of the goods and services produced in this economy. So if a Canadian firm is producing cars in Japan or has operations in Germany, production of goods and services by that Canadian company abroad will not be a part of our GDP. GDP is closely related to aggregate expenditure. Aggregate expenditure refers to the total spending on domestically produced final goods and services. So remember when our domestic households were spending money on final goods and services we called it consumer spending. When firms spend money on final goods and services in Canada we called it investment spending. When our government purchased goods and services produced in Canada we called it government purchases. And when foreigners spend money on our goods, we called it exports. In our total expenditure, if we have spending on foreign produced goods, we must deduct that because that is not spending on our domestic produced final goods and services. Calculating GDP is quite simple. We can calculate GDP in three ways. 
The first one is your expenditure approach, which is simply looking at the aggregate expenditure in the economy. If I look at the total spending on final goods, I will get the total value of final goods in our economy. So we just simply track the total spending on final goods and services by the four sectors, households, firms, government, and the rest of the world. If we track this total spending, we will get our measure of GDP. This is called the expenditure approach. Next, we have the value added approach. In this approach, we calculate the value added by each firm and then sum it up across all firms. And the total value added will give us the total value of final goods and services produced domestically. The third one is your income approach. And in the income approach, which we have already seen briefly in our big diagram, this is just summing up all the factor incomes. If we sum up the total wages, rents, interest and profits of all households that they earn by selling the factor services to firms, we will get another measure of gross domestic product. Now, does it matter which approach we use? It doesn't matter at all because overall, anyone's income is someone else's spending or someone's spending is someone else's income. You can take a very easy example of buying a cup of coffee. And let's assume you are the only individual in the economy and Tim Hortons is the only firm in the economy. If you spend $1 on a cup of coffee, Tim Hortons earns that dollar. Out of that dollar, it has to pay wages, it keeps some profit and it has to buy coffee beans. So it has to resource some input also or some intermediate good. So whether we are looking at our value added approach which is its earning minus its cost of inputs, whether we are summing up the wages and profits of the Tim Hortons or we're looking at the total spending, we'll always get up the same answer. If in your actual data there are slight differences, we refer to those as statistical errors or statistical discrepancies. Theoretically, all three approaches will give you the exact same answer. Let's do an example to see how we can calculate GDP through the expenditure approach. A good idea would be to pause your video, calculate all of these on your own, and then check to see if your answers are matching with mine. So let's write our identities in order to make our calculations easier. Now, before I do the calculations, let me quickly remind you about net tax revenue. NTR is taxes minus transfers. It is earned by the government because government earns taxes and pays out transfers. But NTR is paid by households. Since I don't have my GDP, I can leave disposable income and move on to calculating the overall income first. And this gives you your total GDP as $1,600. Net exports are quite easy. 100 minus 150 is negative 50. So we have a trade deficit. Public savings is your net tax revenue, which is given as 200 minus the government purchases of 300. So we have a budget deficit of $100. Private savings of households are their disposable income minus consumption. So let's go back to disposable income. It's the overall income earned by households. So remember, factor income will be the same as overall spending by the economy. So that is again going to be 1600 minus my net tax revenue gives you $1,400 as your disposable income. Private savings in this case are $600. Next, let's quickly do an example of the value added approach. So in this example, I have only three firms in the economy, the bread, cheese and pizza company respectively. And value added is the value of output minus cost of input or you can think of this input as your raw materials or intermediate goods. So labor or the money that you're spending on labor will not be included as a raw material. So GDP is the total value added and that is back to $200. Another way to check your answer is what are the final goods in this example? The final good in this example is only pizza. Why? Because the all of the output produced by bread company has been purchased by pizza company. All of the output produced by cheese company in this example, $35 worth of cheese, has been purchased by pizza company. So both bread and cheese in this example are inputs or raw materials or intermediate goods, whichever term you want to use. And the only final good we have is pizza. And what's the value of their final good? It is $200. And that is exactly equal to what we got as our GDP. GDP, remember, is the value of final goods.